Okay. A very good afternoon to all Geek Camp participants. So apologies for just now because uh, there were technical difficulties on my co-speaker side. Anyways, let's start off with what we have to present. Okay, so right now we are presenting securing Singapore with augmented reality in the context of COVID-19. So anyways, to bring on the concept of this itself, I have to uh, actually have to uh, have some slides here. So it's my introduction itself. Okay, so I'm a current second year undergrad student working on the plant AR projects. So typically I work on AR objects like this. Okay, give it a while. We are generating the objects. Okay, here you can see is the dragon. Okay, the dragon is here and you can not just see the dragon, but you can also feel that the dragon is roaring, powerful, strong. You can also assume that augmented reality does not just create objects that are animated. It allows you to move around and roam around like the helicopter flying around like this. Yes, you can see it, right? Yes. Okay, so to bring on this concept itself, how we are going to tie augmented reality with securing our infrastructures. We are actually thinking about the, con uh, the context of preventing the power plant from exploding like this or the water from flooding like in the secure water treatment plant like this. Yes, so this is quite a very important aspect of how augmented reality can actually tie in with our critical infrastructures. So we will be bringing on the context of augmented reality to you guys. Okay. I'll be handing over the context to my uh, my friend, co-speaker, Sidan Srivastava, who will be speaking about the context of securing uh, security objects, securing, uh, securing uh, AR with critical infrastructures. Sidan, please. All right, Sid, over to you. Uh, okay, I'm ready. Yep, anytime you can begin. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, uh, organizers, can everyone see my slides? Yep, looking good. Okay, okay, so hi, I'm Sid. And just a second, yeah. I'm a research associate at iTrust. Uh, my background is in computer science and design. So I graduated from uh, Bits Pilani, which is a university in India. Then my back, then I worked at a space agency, at a design organization, at a financial services organization. And the pivotal point came in 2015 uh, through a free and open source a software event called Google Summer of Code, where I had the opportunity to do uh, augmented reality and virtual reality on the Mars City project. So here I got the chance to design habitats in virtual environments back in 2015 when Oculus Rift's development kit one came out. So I've been involved in that ever since. And right now I am working at SUTD. And a lab called iTrust. So if you can see my background, I'll just walk you through the lab. So what you are seeing on the screen right now is my phone's screen being streamed through a Samsung DeX. So I'll just you can see some of the lab in the background, but I'll show you uh, show you show you in much more detail.
Okay, let me walk you through the lab. Uh, organizers, is this clearly visible? Yes, we can yes, see yes. it. Okay, so you saw dragons and water flooding on the on my co-presenter stage, but this is where a flood can actually occur in real life. So the title of our talk was Securing Critical Infrastructures with, uh, with Augmented Reality. So these are the infrastructures which provide water to our homes and other places uh, around Singapore. The, these are the services which power Singapore. So we want to make sure that the, the cyber security of these places is ensured so that we do not run into problems. So let me show you the application what I built. This is a show and tell, so it's better I show you the application first before moving on to why we need such a thing. Okay. So it's trying to, so imagine you are an operator in a critical infrastructure like SWAT, which is the water treatment plant where I am right now. And And you can augment virtual objects inside the real world and monitor the state of every component. So what you see here are the different values of different components overlaid on top of the real world. So this gives you context specific context sensitive information to the real world. And this is very helpful for operators who have been recently tasked with improving the cyber security of existing infrastructures. Now people are not trained in cyber security with such applications and interfaces. We want to help them become better at this task. So instead of going through a very complicated plant, which has many complicated stages, like you can see different pumps, valves, etc., all of which can be attacked by attacked. I mean pumps can explode and tanks can overflow just with uh, just through software. So this is the kind of impact we are talking about. So yesterday one of the talks mentioned cyber physical systems. So this is the perfect example of such a cyber physical system where a cyber attack can have physical disastrous consequences. So this is where we come in and this is where plant AR is very useful. So let me show you the different features of the app. So you can toggle through different stages and see their state on top of the real world. And you can do all of this remotely, by the way. So tele operation is something which is really going to be very important in the post COVID-19 world. So we want to train operators not just on site, but also off site and also monitor the status of the plant. So you can just visualize the entire plant. Let's see if this scenario works here. If it doesn't, it will work on stage in the future. OK, maybe the whole plant can be visualized later in this stage. So. So this is one more thing. So all this is handheld mobile device interfaces. So you can monitor the state of each and every component very easily and see if anything's being uh, if anything is being triggered uh, to reach dangerous values or if something needs the operators help or anything. So you can 
alert the operator in case there is a, there is an attack and the operator can step in and prevent the cyber attack from happening so my co-presenter will present different scenarios of this app later on i want to next focus on why this is important so 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 as you can see if there's a cyber attack you need to be able to alert the operator and the management of the critical infrastructure to stop the cyber attack on time and we are also working on projects which automatically stop cyber attacks in case of a uh, in case the humans are very slow at detecting a cyber attack so one more scenario which make which is made possible is something like indoor navigation so new operators need direction literally and figuratively while they are stepping into a critical infrastructure so you can overlay context sensitive information inside a plan with respect to the real world object so just by pointing at different stages and uh, correlating them with real world locations we can actually perform indoor navigation which is a very big advantage of augmented reality so this includes scenarios of seen under you need to be able to understand what's happening through a scene you need to be able to understand uh, what's in front of the camera so all this is powered by a technology called ar core which Uh, which my co-presenter will explain very very soon so just from the policy point of view i want to touch on one simple aspect before handing it over to my co-presenter yeah so this is what interfaces look like right now so this is a two dimensional touch screen interface or a desktop interface which you can see can be quite complicated for new people to figure out and uh, this is why we want to make extended reality interfaces both in virtual reality as well as augmented reality and even mixed reality moving forward so why this is important because all the local organizations and agencies are really focusing on this in their technology road maps so the infocom media development authority also focuses on this and they have laid this very clearly in their road map same for cyber security agency of singapore so they laid out this master plan which includes immersive training opportunities for operators the same goes for govtech and this is a recurring theme in all the future policies that will ensure the resilience of singapore so without much ado i will hand it back over to my co-presenter and i'll see you guys towards the end of the presentation thank you hi is me back again okay so i'm i'm glad that you hear okay. what my co-speaker has to say about ar and i'm the one who actually coded some portions of it so i'm excited to share with you how do you design and develop ar okay i hope you guys are interested and here Okay, uh, although there are some bits of coding portions to it, but I hope you guys are impressed and you will try to learn something from it. Okay, without further ado, let's start off. So looking on the left, you have user interface, right? On your screen, it's very clear cut. Okay, it's a 2D UI itself. These are the familiar 2D UIs that we are used to, the ugly buttons, swipes, gestures, and yeah, basically that. So what we are trying to do is, use 3D objects to generate out images like this. Actually, it's not images, but it's objects, but it looks like images to you. Okay. What we see in 3D AR itself is also not just about the 3D experience here, but also the 2D controls itself. So you saw some uh, exciting stuff like this. Okay, just now, Sidon tried to showcase the 
image itself, but it wasn't very clear. This is the real one taken, the footage taken from my phone. So this is the actual one. Imagine your data running through this. Wouldn't it be more interactive than the typical uh, layout seen by the engineers itself? I would rather look at this itself. Okay, second thing. We also have controls like this. Okay, so imagine you have an alarm that allows to tell you that, hey, there's an attack on the system itself. So you have the audio volume to control the voice. And also there's a vibration to alert you if there's an attack. And lastly, there's a notification, which did, we didn't show you, but there's a notification. So in a sense, you're creating a service that actually uh, issue a message into your audio system itself. So when you're, when you're swiping through your phone itself, like you automatically check uh, whether there's a situation in which there's an attack. So when there's an attack, your messaging will automatically tell you that there's an attack. Yes, so that's how it is. Okay, so moving on, how are the components to build AR? So I'm pretty sure there are people who, who believe that they, are, uh, they want to try out AR, but the, these are the typical ones that I actually tried using. I use Firebase, AR Core, and Android Jackpack. Okay, I will explain to you a bit about why I use all of this. So starting off, AR Core itself. Okay, looking from the left itself, how do you actually generate AR core images and objects? How do the objects appear? This is using a SDK formed by AR core. So AR core is a typical uh, platform to actually generate out render images objects in real space. So it's just a uh, it's just a base renderer. But in the context of how you're going to do it, you have to use a SDK, same form SDK, or you can use Unity or Unreal Engine. So what are the differences between SimForm, Unity, Unreal? Okay, these are all renderers. Renderer or rendering engines, you call them. Okay, SimForm is used in native rendering, which I did. There are people who use Unity. There are people who love Unreal. So I have no words to say, but I prefer to use SimForm because it's native. It, there's support for native Android, which is more capable, I would say, uh, especially when you're talking about AR. Okay, AR is very intensive on power consumption. As you know, you might know it. Your camera uses a lot of power. Your data runs a lot of power. Imagine that your data is running through a lot, like 50 objects in one second or two seconds. So that's the challenge of making AR together with data. Okay, so SimForm also helps you to benefit in another way. It avoids you from writing OpenGL. For example, your activity can go up to 900 lines long if you're writing an OpenGL code, which I wouldn't recommend if you have uh, something like Simfon SDK. So this is something that I hope that you guys can go and try it out on your own. Okay, uh, okay, sorry for the, <laughs> the animation. Okay, moving on. So data management. Okay, as you guys know, just now I was talking about data management. So how do I actually integrate data management? I use Firebase. Okay, Firebase, okay, there are three functions to Firebase itself. We will start off with real-time database and Cloud Firestore. So when you're actually seeing the data running through, right, do you think, how do you think, how do you visualize this data is running through? It's through the database itself. So if you're integrating a database, you have to pick, you can choose a few areas, but I chose Firebase because Firebase has the capability of doing offline data persistence, threading, code maintenance. So it makes it very simple for me. Yes. And second thing, there's crash lytics. So if there's an attack, oh, sorry, not attack. If there's a crash due to code bugs, it makes it very easy for testing purposes. And it allows me to do prompt fixes, uh, which I really do need because it's impossible for me to test 1,000 times just to make sure that the app works fine for uh, such a, uh, like, for example, I, I showcasing to people, imagine if it crashes, it's a bit shameful or uh, embarrassing, like, because it's an app development and you think the apps are made to not crash, but in fact, apps crash a lot. It's through trial and errors like this, crash critics that allows you to help you to benefit from making better apps that do not crash. Lastly, there's messaging. For example, if there's an attack, in the SWAT network, like the water system plants. So what it does is that the person managing Firebase can actually broadcast a message to all users. Uh, the users in this case will be your engineers who will quickly go and fix 
find a fix for such a problem itself. Yes, and this is quite important and allows you to make very prompt judgments when there's emergency cases. Okay, so these are very technical stuff. I hope that you guys keep along with it. Okay, so I'll be bringing you two principles, but the first one will be single source of truth principle. So this is a very app development type of uh, principle. Okay, so at the start, I have two data sources and running through a certain app, which is your software here. Okay, for my case itself, I have two data uh, sources. One of it is the SQLite and another one is API, Firebase API itself. So if I have two data sources and uh, why I have one app, so the app takes data from which data source? Name your pick. Okay. Imagine if I pumping two data sources into one app. So what will happen to the app is that there may be glitches and there may be unwanted uh, experiences to the user itself. Like for example, crashes or it may be some problems with the app functionality. So what you want to do is to actually merge the two sources into one. Yes, like this, single data source. So this single data source will pump the data directly to the software and makes it more capable and more easily managed. That's why you should always use a single source of truth principle. But the creation of a single source of truth principle is not so easy as it seems. Okay, so how do I actually do it? Is to ensure that you pump data, Firebase data to a local data cache. What it does is it makes it very consistent and make it fast, yes. I'm pretty sure everyone needs fast, uh, fast data connection, right? Yeah, what it does is it prevents lagginess. Like when your network is down or that kind of thing, imagine if your app crashes because of that kind of reasoning. It's quite ugly. So what it does is the local data cache will cache and keep some state, data state of it and makes it exciting and so that you can still work with it. The app doesn't crash. So when the network is back up, your data is updated. Yes, and lastly, sorry, and lastly, you'll be working on clean code architecture because when you're actually managing two data sources, it's very difficult to use clean data, clean code architecture. So with one, you merge into one, you actually allows you to have clean code architecture and you can actually use something called MVVM architecture, which is called model view view model. So on the right side, we have this itself. So this is the typical MVVM structure. There's activity and fragment, Okay, not an or a fragment. Okay, there's a view model, there's a repository model and remote data source. So my model is SQLite in this case. Remote data source is Firebase, not the retrofit. Okay, moving on. So why Android Jetpack and MVVM? So you might think that it's quite important, right? Uh, why, why, why do I mention it? Okay, this is actually another concept that I hope most developers uh, will agree with me because we always are very keen on uh, on this concept called violation of the separation of concerns. Okay, so if you have uh, separation of concerns, it allows you to do debugging and UI testing easily because you sorry not UI testing unit testing easily because if you have problems with a certain area like a certain object, you can just swap it up and easily test it. Okay, now I will be bringing you back slightly to the MVVM structure that we are used to uh, or I am used to. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start off with what MVVM has. Okay, MVVM has model, view, view model. So I'll be talking about the view model first. In the view model context, you'll be holding the UI data. And this is especially important because of separating out the data from whatever you have in the next, which is the activity. Because in your activity, your drawing, your application, your phone is busily drawing UI. So it has a threading of its own. You're drawing the UI on a single thread. Imagine if you have data running through your UI thread. It makes it very unsightly and very difficult to debug if there are problems with your app itself. And next thing, for activity, it's typically very long already itself. You're going to draw the UI, the draw the widgets, the buttons, whatever. Yes, and you have UI interactions like button presses. You have uh, tap, uh, taps like in 3D AR. Yes, these are all UI interactions. And this also takes up codes. So imagine your data and your activity is merged together. It's going to be very chaotic. And lastly, you have something called a repository. Repository does, what it does is it saves and loads your app data. And this is actually very essential in, uh, in why applications are created in this context. So I hope that uh, everyone understands why this is a very important concept. 
uh, then and also it, this is actually not just applies to AR itself it applies to all apps yes if you're creating an app you have to consider all three contexts you cannot just throw all the data into activity you cannot just throw the all the saving and loading of data into the activity your activity is not the dumping ground yes so I hope that you guys do some separation and do some creation and think through how you're going to create your codes. Lastly, how MVVM structurized is this? It boils down to four points. So the first point would be you're using the room database to create local database cache via data access objects. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to show all the codes, so I just do a rough outline for you guys. I uh, hope you guys go and look up on it. Is something interesting that I hope uh, most developers should focus on. Yes, uh, it can be also MVI structure. There are many other structures too. So, but I'll be containing on MVVM. Back to this MVVM. So, after the room data caching, you have background threads. So, in your repository, you can actually do um, async tasks running through all your data in the repository. So, you can insert, update, and delete data. It makes it very easy for you to manage. Third point, you can also Use view model to observe changes in data, avoid memory leaks and lifecycle challenges. Lifecycle challenges is a real problem for Android programming. Because, for example, if your activity closes but your data is still running, what will happen? You have a crash, definitely. So what we what you should do is use observation uh, using observing of data, using observers, you can you can avoid this kind of lifecycle challenges. It avoids memory leaks, it auto settles it for you. Lastly, you have, you can also integrate with other codes, uh, the best practices of coding, like data binding or view binding if you want to. Okay, I use data binding because it's easier for me. Okay, data binding avoids boilerplate codes. So you see, all this architecture boils down to one thing, is to reduce boilerplate codes, reduce problems for you, try to be more structurized in your creation of your codes and makes it more better, better, uh, makes the app better for users itself and also better for you to de debug itself. Yep. So how to generate an object in real 3D space? I'm pretty sure I've been talking about all the best practices, but you guys want to see some codes, right? So here we are. So we start off with this. So AR fragment equals bracket AR fragment casting get support fragment manager dot five fragment by id r dot id dot ui ux dot underscore fragment this is the typical way you start uh, you start off declaring a fragment itself so you're actually finding the fragment and you're just labeling the fragment and assigning the fragment itself then follow on you will actually see this so you're tapping the plane to generate an object so the model model renderable dot builder is just to generate a model a model 3d model itself and you're setting the source to an online source. Okay, this one is an online source. There are also local source. So it's just a preference. Uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll be using the online reference to show you guys. Okay, then after that, you'll be moving on to then accept. So you actually add a model to the scene, as you can see from the, the, uh, the method here. Uh, I can actually show you guys. Uh, give me a while. Okay, yeah, here's the add model to scene. This is the next method that I'll be showing you guys. Okay, lastly, you have to catch the, all the errors. Like for example, if a renderable, which is your model, is not rendering, something goes wrong. So you throw an error message and prevents crashes. So it's very essential that you have this in all cases. So then lastly, you have add model to scene. So you're actually adding the model to the scene. So the model is your 3D object, which is here. Model renderable here. View renderable, this one is a 2D layout. I, I put it here on purpose because uh, I just want to show you guys that there is view renderable, which is for 2D views. So you can just, uh, just now Sidon was showing the, the text, the 2D text, uh, you press the button, then you got some stage pop up, 2D UI pop up, it's, the, it's called view renderable. And the model renderable, model renderable that we see is like the water tanks and the typical, all the actuators and the sensors. So those are 3D objects. Lastly, we have the anchors. So anchors are positions or coordinates itself, as you can see here. And lastly, you have transformable node. So a transformable node allows you to stretch bigger, smaller, rotate, move, yeah, that kind of thing. So you have all this on your own hands. It's just how you manage, how you uh, creatively create codes that 
makes it uh, makes it essential uh, as part of your AR project itself. And yep, there's another another thing called Node itself, which you can see here. So what Node does is the opposite of transformable Node. Transformable Node allows you to move, rotate, but the Node typical Node does not allow you to. But it allows you to. Uh, it has a lot of functionalities like, uh, for example. You do not you want the node to be restricted to the ground, so this is actually very essential. Okay. Lastly, before we end off, we have to actually make the object appear, right? So you have to add this anchor node to the scene. So this is actually very essential. So if you don't add the anchor node to the scene itself, you actually your object does not appear. So yes, this is actually an essential part of the code itself. Okay. In total, this is the sample outline of the code. So uh, this is a very simple, simple example of how AR is being written. My codes are not like this. I hope you guys understand it. Uh, the codes uh, that I've written is a bit more, uh, more difficult to understand, but it's on the same lines. The understanding is on the same lines. It's just how you implement it. Yes. Before I hand over to Sid, I would like to say a thank you for you guys who are hearing both me and Sid talk today. Uh, talk today. Okay, so I hope you guys actually are happy with the quotes. Uh, if you guys want to see the quotes, just join us in the watercolor room. Okay, I'll be handing over back to Sid to wrap up for the content itself. Sid, please. Okay, so uh, if everyone can hear me, we saw that Geek Camp is very. Uh, proudly being uh, presented using augmented reality like dragons you see dragons on the screen and this is what uh, covid 19 has caused us to switch to so we will see a lot of more augmented reality both in conferences as well as critical infrastructure sectors that i list here so the reason it's important is it's a big market it's a $900 million cybersecurity market, and we do not want another single health cyber attack scenario, and definitely not another cyber physical attack scenario. So this is where test beds like the one I am at, see the secure water treatment test bed at SUTD and ITRES, they come into picture. And this is where uh, apps like Plant AR can be very useful. So this help this helps us to monitor all the attack points and it helps us visualize operations and security because we always have a choice between believing what the system wants to tell us versus what the real value is and show them to the users in a very friendly way through augmented reality applications. So we started with virtual reality actually and very recently we switched to augmented reality. So. Uh, we want both interfaces. We want people and operators and policymakers to be able to visualize dangerous scenarios in both these interfaces. We want them to be able to detect attacks very precisely. We want them to be able to operate the plant remotely because all these things are very important in the post COVID-19 world where we may not have access to physical locations anymore. So the VR technology has been presented internationally and also to many policymakers like the president of Chile, uh, like senior minister Pio Chihian, and also at many in places locally, including a talk for kids. So we want to inspire kids through these talks as well because free and open source software is what we are using to build everything. And we want this talk to maybe inspire a few kids. So thank you for being a very awesome audience. Thank you to all the Geek Camp volunteers. And you can follow me on LinkedIn or you can reach out to Marcus. Both of us will be hanging out in the water cooler room to answer any of your questions. Thanks a lot.